Rev up your engine! Now here's some interesting car information. Turns out that car sales are rapidly increasing now, even during the second wave of the coronavirus. What's behind it? Well, let's put on our thinking caps. A lot of people that used to use public transportation do no longer feel safe, so they need to get a car. So there's more car sales. And those who have been working in an office, say they took a train or a bus to the office, now they're working at home, but they got to get somewhere from home, so they need a car. So people that didn't have cars are now buying cars, or they're buying a second car, because maybe the wife's got a car, but the husband didn't because he commuted to work, and now it's like, hey, I need a car too. So car sales are up, they're going up. The thing about that is though, the choices are kind of going down because, of course, they don't have a big backlog of cars to sell because they weren't producing them full capacity, and they're ramping that up. So if you are going to get something popular like a pickup truck that seemed to be selling off the walls, you better hurry up and do it before they run out. <laughs> <laughs> and if it doesn't have exactly what you want, you better buy it or you order it. It might be months from now before you get it. So it looks like things are starting to come back in the car sales business. Hannah Hip says, my dad's looking to find me a good car to send me off to college. He doesn't like Corollas because they're small. He's thinking of a Camry or a Mazda 3. Mazda 3 is what he's leaning for. I want it to be reliable because my mom's Pathfinder has had so much work. I don't want to repeat. I go Camry because they just last so long. They just last and last and last and last. The Mazda 3, the newer ones, are better than they used to be. There's no arguing that. Toyota owns a percentage of Mazda, and they got a deal going in, I believe, Alabama now, where they're making them on the same assembly line. They both own a factory. So, you know, they are better than they were, but Camrys can last forever. If he buys your Camry, I mean, you might be driving that thing for 20 or 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's just my opinion. I'd go that way. But, I mean, if you like the Mazda 3, if you're talking about a new one, they are pretty well built. You can decide what you want. But, hey, the smartest thing to do is to buy a used one. Don't buy a new one. A new one is foolish. You're throwing your money away. The Camrys are so well made, you can buy a good used one, save a ton of money, and drive it forever. Mustafa says, I have a 2018 Genesis G80 in mind or a 2017 Lexus GS 350 F Sport. Which do you think I should buy? I know they're not making the F Sport anymore. The reason they're not making it is because it's more a sales thing. It's not that it was a bad car. It's just that there's so many different models out there, and sometimes they have too many of one and not enough of another, and then a lot of them cross over with each other. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with the Lexus. You'll always be able to get parts for it. That's no problem. Now, I would personally go for the Lexus because the Genesis, they are fun cars to drive when they're new, but as they age, they wear a lot faster. To give you an example, I had a customer with one, brought it over. He said, it's not idling. Right, so I put on my computer and I saw that it's a four cam engine, it has four cams, camshafts, and they showed 15 to 20 percent wear on some of them with 100,000 miles. I then had a Lexus that had like 150,000 miles, and I checked that, and it had almost no wear at all, like 1 percent, 2 percent, sometimes 0 percent wear on the cams. You realize the Lexus is better made. Now, if you're a short-term guy, and you're only going to drive it for three or four years, and you're talking about vehicles that have less than like 130,000 miles on it, you could get a Genesis, uh, but it's not going to last like a Lexus. The Lexus is just better made, and they're going to last a lot longer. Kraza says, is a second-hand 2015 Kia Optima a good car to buy. I bought one with 150,000 miles. Do you think it's a wise choice? It's got a lot of miles on it. I hope you didn't overpay. With that kind of mileage, it's not worth that much. But it depends on how that mileage was put on. To give you an example, I got a customer with a Kia Optima. He's a sales rep, and he put 200,000 miles on in three years. That's highway driving. That's equivalent 200,000 miles to about 20,000 miles of city driving, so it's still got some life left in it. But let's say that 150,000 miles was put in at stop and go city driving, the car's going to be relatively worn out. You'd have to know the actual history of the car. Now, if you would have said it had, you know, 80,000 or 70,000, I'd say, yeah, it can still last quite some time. But you got to find out what kind of mileage it was. And you never overpay for a car with 150. It doesn't matter how it was put on. A used car with 150,000 miles does not go for much money in the real world. Maybe in a fantasy world of those make-believe book values that mean nothing, but in the real world, they're not worth much. Hey, my name is Scotty, too. 
Anyways, I got a 2004 Volvo S60 2.5 turbo, 5-speed automatic. Should I spend money to upgrade it during the rebuild, performance, or should I get a 2007 to 11 S60R with a standard transmission? I'm not that big of a Volvo fan, but they are fun to drive around. And if you really like Volvos, my advice would be just upgrade it to another car. Don't try rebuilding your and beefing it up. To do that right is a complex thing. This isn't just simple stuff that anybody can do. And a lot of guys don't do it right. And then you're going to be really crying in your beer because you spend a bunch of money and it doesn't work right. You're better to go get the newer one. That's be a smart move than it would be to try to upgrade yours. Uh, it's not like it was back when I was young when you could get an engine and had a six, you could throw in an eight and beef it up, but they were pretty cheap and simple. They're so complex these days. Go get a newer one if that's what you want. I mean, you can pick whatever car you want. You like Volvos, yeah, get a newer one. That makes more sense. Jay Learson says, my truck is very slow to take off. It's like it's bogged down. What can be some of the possible reasons? I replaced the air filter with a cold air intake, both knock sensors, spark plugs, wires. I've looked at multiple times by mechanics and they couldn't figure it out. Some mechanics you took it to, they sound like a bunch of knuckleheads. The biggest problem that you're going to see when you change all that stuff and it's still kind of bogging down is the fuel filter is clogged or the fuel pump isn't operating correctly. And here's the reason behind that. If you have a failure with other systems like the MAF sensor, like the fuel injectors running rich, running lean, it's going to trip codes and give data that any mechanic can read in a second. Now, yeah, there's a lot of dumb guys out there. Maybe you met the three stooges of the mechanics world, didn't know what they were doing. But I'm assuming some mechanic you had check out stuff says, oh, we don't know what's wrong. The reason I say fuel filter or fuel pump is because most cars, except for some very modern ones, the computer has no idea what the fuel pressure is. Nothing in there that tells the computer, oh, fuel pressure is this. So it doesn't know what the fuel pressure is. So it can't trip a code for the fuel pump's bad because it doesn't know what the pressure is. And if it does bog down, it's often the fuel pump isn't pumping enough fuel. Either the filter's clogged or the pump's going out. Now, another thing that can be is the catalytic converter. As they heat up, if it's old, if they get clogged up, they can't throw the exhaust gas out fast enough. Realize your car is a giant air pump. It sucks in air and it throws out exhaust gas. And if those catalytic converters clog up as they heat up, they can't throw the exhaust. And when you take off, they'll bog down because they can't get rid of the exhaust. Any mechanic with their salt can pressure test those catalytic converters. You can actually learn how to do it yourself. You can buy a little pressure gauge for like 80 bucks, take off the oxygen sensor, stick it in there, and then measure the pressure. And if the pressure is like 4 or 5 PSI, it should be like half a pound or something. If it's 4 or 5 or higher PSI, it means the catalytic converter is clogged up. That's the common things that do that. Ryan V says, hey, Scotty, what do you think of Ford's built in Canada like some of the older F-150 and Panther body cars. Yeah, they do a great job. Now, Canadians do a great job building cars, period. Second car I ever had was a Ford Maverick. It was made in Oakville, Ontario. I got a friend who grew up in Oakville, Ontario. I went to school in Toronto. They make great cars. I paid 550 bucks for that Maverick and I drove it all over the place and I sold it for 350 bucks like 10, 12 years later when I got a Toyota. I also now have my wife's old Toyota Matrix. It was made in Cambridge, Ontario. Now, the Japanese saw so much of the make it in Cambridge, Ontario, they don't make uh, matrices anymore. And instead, in Cambridge, Ontario, they let them make Lexuses. So they knew that the Canadians, it's a good job. They said, okay, you can make the Lexuses now too, our top flagship cars. Canadians make excellent cars. I'll tell you, if I had a choice, I would get a vehicle that was made in Canada. Now, I like the Japanese ones the most, but I mean, my second choice would be a Japanese car made in Canada or a Ford made in Canada. <laughs> Canadians do good work. You know, they got a different society. It's a more laid back. They treat them a little bit better there in Canada and people generally do a better job at what they're doing when they're happy. <laughs> you don't want disgruntled people making your cars. <laughs> Audi Beth says, Hey, watch your videos about additives not really being necessary. What about heat? I live in Wisconsin, get pretty cold here. Okay, well, heat is a different thing. Heat is to remove water because if you're up north in the winter and you have water in your gas tank, guess what happens? It freezes and you can't go anywhere. I grew up in Niagara Falls and I know about that stuff. So, if you're worried about water in your gas, go ahead and add the heat. It just absorbs water, you know? So if it freezes, you don't have any problem. Let's say you got a really junky old car. It'll keep your old 
gas tank from rusting and stuff from water going in because it absorbs the water and if you're worried about that but of course if you have good gasoline you don't care and realize that almost every single modern car for a long time has a plastic gas tank they went to plastic gas tanks quite some time ago so you don't have to worry about rust in a plastic gas tank now you're always hearing me rail about i hate plastic scotty thinks plastic is crap plastic junk well in the case of gas tanks at least they don't rust anymore <laughs> now they will crack if you hit them where the metal ones can bend and they won't break but <laughs> at least they don't rust so you got a plastic gas tank you're kind of pissing in the wind and throwing heat in it because you don't need it but if you're buying and really crappy gas at a cheap station that pumps water yeah <laughs> put some in so it doesn't freeze so if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos remember to ring that bell